It's wonderful to have Ronnie Amasri with us again. Um, I first met Ronnie uh, uh, some years back in the days when our government and, and a couple of other governments pushed the UN into doing serious damage to the people of Iraq. It was during the period when uh, 600,000 children in Iraq perished for lack of the very basic needs, medicine, food, anything. The list was just grotesque. Uh, Rania was very active and, and very clear about what was going on at a time when, when people were pretty much looking away and our media just were not uh, saying anything about it. So um, recently, uh, a year ago, we had her here and she gave, she gave us such an in-depth view of who was, uh, who, who was pushing this anti-Syrian government violence uh, and brought up such direct information that just notice in the media uh, when the number of people killed in the conflict in Syria is mentioned, are both sides, are the numbers distinguished? government troops and militia and the resistance, uh, the, the uh, people who are uh, fighting the government. Um, Rania pointed out that the 100,000 that was being bandied about as if there was only one side who suffered in the 100,000, that would be 100,000 um, civilians. Um, of, the, of that number, something like 43,000 were Syrian military and militia. Now, does that change the picture? And that, uh, that kind of fraudulent reference uh, persists, and it's just so important when we, uh, when we have access to uh, information that's often sort of hidden in the mainstream media, maybe on page 38 or 79, and, um, and, and with a little start, we can find our way through it as well. Um, Rania has been teaching uh, in Lebanon and uh, is returning to Lebanon in just a few days and um, the University of Balamond is where she's been teaching um, and she it, it has or will be accepting a position at the American University in Beirut. Um, so um, Rania come give us some background and, and what the action points might be, Ray Gaza and, the, and Palestine. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I have to say it's getting more and more difficult to talk about this issue. I've been speaking about this all summer and every time it gets harder. Today has been a particularly difficult day because today was when the second ceasefire was supposed to end. So we were monitoring it hour by hour. You know, five hours left till the end of the ceasefire, four hours, three hours. And the whole time I'm thinking about the people that I know in Gaza and wondering what could happen to them. And one of the people that came to mind was just this gentleman. He's a friend of a friend. And as we say, a friend of a friend is a friend. And my friend who took his picture is a man by the name of Muhammad Matar, also known as Abu Yazan. And Abu Yazan went to Gaza and he saw this man who was brushing his teeth in dirty water. So brushing his teeth in very contaminated water because right now, actually before the bombing, 95% of all the water in Gaza was not suitable for human use. And now it is zero percent in the sense that there is no one in Gaza of the 1.8 million people that has safe and secure access to water. No one. So this was an individual at an UNRWA school who was brushing his teeth with, dirt, with dirty water and my friend asked him, he said, you know, we have bottles of water that are clean. Why don't you brush your teeth with clean water? And he said, I'd rather my teeth fall out than deprive someone of water and make him thirsty. And this has been the sentiment that has been roaring throughout Gaza with Palestinian solidarity being like it's never been. A unified stance of people taking care of each other like never before, but still they've never been in this harsh of a situation. So I was thinking about him and wondering, as well as my friends and family that are there 
what would happen when the bombs drop. One and a half hours before the ceasefire was supposed to end, I hear from friends in Gaza that F-16s are going overhead, drones are going overhead, certain areas are being bombed. And then 30 minutes before the ceasefire was supposed to end, we hear breaking news that the ceasefire has been extended for another 72 hours. And then, half an hour ago, I hear news again from friends in Gaza. No, that's not true. North Gaza has been attacked. East Gaza has been attacked. There's heavy drone artillery, heavy drone in overhead, and there's F-16s flying again. And I'm here, and I'm one of the privileged ones. I cannot imagine what it would be like to be there and to have no idea are you going to be under attack? Are you not going to be under attack? Will the ceasefire be extended? Will it not be extended? With the Navy, the military, Air Force, all of them just gearing. This has been today. You know, and to put this into perspective, when we're talking ceasefires, no ceasefire, we don't know, even know now if the ceasefire is holding or if it will break again, we just don't know. We have, as is presented by the mainstream media, two sides to the so-called conflict. With one side, the Israelis going to the negotiations in Egypt and saying, this is what we are willing to offer the Palestinians. We are willing to offer the Palestinians a ceasefire on the condition that the Palestinian Authority, under the leadership of Mahmoud Abbas, whose presidency expired years ago and is no longer a legitimate president, that Mahmoud Abbas and the Palestinian Authority be given control of Gaza. So basically to renege the democratic elections that brought Hamas to power. Second, that the blockade would continue but it would be eased. And it would be eased to the point that national Israeli security would have to be equal to economic empowerment of the population in Gaza. This is the language that's been presented by the Israeli government. So the Israeli government is saying we will let whatever would go into Gaza as long as it's not deemed a threat to Israeli national security. What could be a threat to Israeli national security? Well, you can figure it out. Cement could be. If you're going to use cement to build tunnels, too bad that you need cement to build your homes. We could go on with dual use, and I'll talk about dual use later. There is nothing at all in the Israeli negotiation about opening of a seaport or opening of an airport or release of the Palestinians that have been arrested without trial, just detained. Nothing at all about any of the requests by the Palestinian team. This is what the Israelis have to offer. Supported by the Egyptian government, the Saudi Arabian government, the government of the United Arab Emirates, and most definitely supported by the US government. On the other side, you have the Palestinians. And what they're actually asking for is less than their rights. They're not even asking for implementation of international law. They're asking for partial implementation of international law. They're specifically asking for lifting the siege and opening the border crossings to commerce and to people. Now, the siege has been determined by the United Nations to be illegal. So again, they're asking for the implementation of law. They're asking for an establishment of either a seaport or an airport under United Nations supervision. So they're saying, we will relinquish our own sovereignty, bring the United Nations, they can supervise the seaport and the airport. But it is ludicrous to have populations in Gaza having to go through Egypt to travel or having to go through Jordan to travel or having to get through these crossings that they're not even allowed to get into. They're asking for the fishing zone to actually be implemented because according to the Oslo Accords from 1993 and 1994 and according to international law, you have the right to fish in your waters. So what they're asking for is that fishermen be allowed to fish up to 10 kilometers. That's not asking for much. But as of yet, they're barely able to fish almost two kilometers. They're asking for international forces on the borders. They're asking for conditions for people to pray at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And these are rejected. And as the Israeli foreign minister recently said that, I'm quoting here, the Israeli military should take steps to defeat Hamas militarily if the truce collapses, which is where we are now. And I quote, Israel cannot afford a war of attrition. He says, we need to finish the story. What is the story that needs to be finished? How do we even define finishing the story? Isn't this an open call for genocide and ethnic cleansing? What does it mean to finish the story? What does this actually mean? 
and imagine all this threat and yet you have people in Gaza that are saying we don't want a ceasefire. My friend issued the same statement just a few minutes ago. We don't want a ceasefire. If the ceasefire means the blockade is not lifted, we don't want a ceasefire. And it's easy for people like me to say that. But when you have individuals such as Muhammad Asad, I'm sorry, Muhammad Ayyad, 19 years of age, who's already lost 18 members of his family in the past few weeks. And he says, without lifting the siege, I do not welcome any ceasefire, even if all my family end up killed. What does that mean? What, what are people actually asking for? I mean, we've had since July 8, 1,965 Palestinians killed, more than 10,000 injured. The individuals that you see here, Barak Ibrahim Abd Rabbu, 51 years of age, and her son, Ibrahim Jamal Abd Rabbu, 21 years of age. They were killed in late July. We've had more than 70 families lose more than three members of their family. If you can imagine what that is. You have here this young eight-year-old girl, Yara Abdissalam Al-Farra. You have her brother, 12 years of age, Muhammad Mahmoud Al-Farra. You have Lujain Basim Al-Farra, four years of age. And Abdul Rahman Al Farra also eight, all members of the same family. There were nine members of that family that were killed, and they're one of seventy. Four hundred sixty-seven children have been killed thus far. This is one of the injured, Rama, one of the injured. And when we look at this and we try to examine what that actually means to have so many people just killed. I have to go back and look at poetry. Khalid Jama, a Palestinian poet from Gaza, writes, O oh, rascal children of Gaza, you who constantly disturb me with your screams under my window, you who filled every morning with rush and chaos, you who broke my vase and stole the lonely flower on my balcony, come back and scream as you want and break all the vases, steal all the flowers, come back, just come back. Amidst all this direct killing, even in these three days of a ceasefire, we still had killing because we have 2,000 unexploded ordinances in Gaza. 2,000 unexploded ordinances. Now, in 2006, in the Israeli war against Lebanon, they literally littered 20% of the country with cluster bombs, and Lebanese children continue to be injured and wounded and killed from those cluster bombs. Yesterday we had five people killed as they were trying to protect one of these unexploded ordinances from exploding. Six people were critically injured. The gentleman whose picture you see here is Hazem Ahmed Abu Murad, 38. He's the head of the team in Gaza that actually goes forward and tries to protect the people from these unexploded ordinances that are often found in their homes. Bilal Muhammad al Sultan, 27, Taysir Ali al Hum, 40, and Hazem Ahmed Abu Murad were killed, as well as Italian journalist Simon Camilli, 35. So you have killings that go on at the end of the killings, and the killings are not just in Gaza, they're also in the West Bank. And this is where it takes a whole other level because it's one thing to have your child being killed by an F 16 or a drone. But I think it takes a whole other level of barbarity to have a, show, a soldier look at your child and shoot. And to be a parent witnessing that soldier shooting the child. Khalid Al-Anati was killed, 11 years old. His crime was he was standing at the door of his house. The bullet entered through his back and went out through his stomach. Two others were killed in the same weekend. And this has gotten to be such regular practice that one Israeli comrade said, it is just a boy, and Ha'aretz refuses to say that it's just a boy, so easy to kill, so hard to report. This is the regular situation that Palestinians have to endure and have been enduring, the regular situation. So when people ask me who launched the first rocket, forgive me if I don't have any patience for those questions anymore. Even though 
The rockets were not launched from Gaza. The rockets were launched after the bombardment of Gaza by the Israeli military. But I have been saying this all month, and I think it bears repeating. Even if the Palestinians were the first to launch those rockets, it would not be a provocation. It would be a retaliation of the occupation. And Gaza remains under occupation. And a population that is under occupation has the legal and ethical right to resist, including through armed resistance. You look at these infographics. This is Gaza, approximately the size of Raleigh with 1.8 million people. This is Gaza. The yellow dots that you see are the concentration of the bombardments. And yet, it doesn't really give a sense. You can, you can have an idea of how vast the bombardments have been distributed from south to north. But to me, it doesn't bring it home. So Mona al farra whose family lost nine members, decided to drive around Gaza. This is Khuz'a. This was an agricultural village. This village used to have fruit trees and vegetable fields. Now, when Dr. Mona al farra drove through, she had to stop several times because the stench of the dead bodies was so overpowering. She had to constantly stop. Whole entire neighborhoods have been erased. People that have tried to return to their homes have no idea where their homes used to be. This is the level of destruction that we're talking about here. And to get a sense of what this destruction is, this is the before, this is the after. That's the sense of the destruction. And yet, the New York Times and our administration talk of rockets, rockets, that if they were launched at this church, the church would remain standing. There would simply be a hole in the wall. These are F-16 bombardments. And they bomb everything. This is the Islamic University of Gaza that was bombed by Israeli F-16 warplanes. And this isn't the first time the university was bombed. The university was bombed in 2008. And when somebody on one of the US networks, whether it was CNN or some other network, I failed to remember, was interviewing a member of the Israeli army and they were talking about the bombardment of the university, he actually asked him, are classes in session? Did you wait for classes not to be in session before you bombed? As if that makes it all right. To give it a sense of what's been destroyed, we need to understand something. It's not just the destruction of thousands of homes six out of nine major hospitals, of hundreds of schools, of UN shelters, of dozens and dozens of mosques, of the largest mosque in Gaza, a historic mosque. It's not just that. It's also been a deliberate destruction of the economy in Gaza. The best factories in Gaza have been destroyed, the ones that serve up to 70% of the local market needs. The largest food factories, the ones that were not destroyed in 2010 and not destroyed in 2008, were destroyed in this war. If we remember in 2010, the Israeli army were scared of Palestinian chickens. They killed more than 30,000 chickens. With the idea being very simple, the Israeli army wanted to deny Palestinians their right to feed themselves. Therefore, chickens were a threat. Palestinian economy has been taken back to zero. It will take six to eight billion dollars to rebuild it, working night and day for 10 years, assuming the siege is lifted. And we have to remember, Gaza is a coastal city. You have fishermen, but the fishermen were attacked. The fishermen were bombed, their seaport was bombed, the Israeli Navy ship has already attacked Gaza fishermen at least 177 times, attacking fishermen. Look at these boats. Think about the Israeli Navy. You can get an idea of who's threatening whom here. Under the Oslo Accords, as I said, Palestinians should be granted access to 20 nautical miles off of the coast. And yet, yesterday, fishermen were attacked by the Israeli Navy when they tried to fish close to one mile off the coast. This was yesterday during the official ceasefire. And yet the media did not say that Israelis violated the ceasefire by attacking Palestinian fishermen. Attacking Palestinian fishermen also means that they cannot get motors to run their ships. Everything has been destroyed. 
And when we look at the siege, you know, a lot of times people think that the siege began when Hamas won a fair election. This is the thing about democracy. If you want people to vote, you can't hold them responsible if they vote for someone you don't like. Imagine if people did it to us in this country. I don't remember a president who's won the election that I'd liked. Actually, the only one I like is FDR, so um, since then. Gaza was first ghettoized in 1994. 1994, after the signing of the Oslo Accords, the Israeli army built a fence around Gaza before they built the apartheid wall in the West Bank. It was first ghettoized in 1994, and the siege has been intensifying since 2005, 2006, so on and so forth. It's been intensifying. And what kind of siege are we talking about? What does this mean to be under siege? That means you have your enemy determining what you should have. Toilet paper, maybe not. Books, no. Ink, no. Pine nuts, no. Hummus, oh yes. I'm not making this up. You think about the, the ludicrousy of being trapped, being bombed, and being denied ink. Having no way out, no way in, and no ability to build the economy. To get an idea of how much the economy in Gaza has been destroyed, just compare it over the past 10 years. In the year 2000, more than 15,000 truckloads would leave Gaza a year. There was an export. More than 15,000 truckloads were leaving. In five years, 15,000 truckloads became 9,000 truckloads. In 2007, it became 5,000 truckloads. By 2012, it was 162 truckloads. Truckloads, this was the extent of the export in Gaza. And of course, now it has become zero. It's even worse than that, and there have been so many people that have talked about this, and Noam Chomsky is just one of many who talks about the fact that you have an Israeli government that dictates how many calories are sufficient for Palestinians. Because they want just enough to be a little bit above heavily malnourished, but not enough for growth. The mere fact that you have an occupying body determining how many calories you need to subsist is a moral violation of such a high degree. So it comes as no surprise that we have statements such as this. Mohammed Saliman, a, a journalist in Gaza who writes, we are tired of war. I, for one, have had enough of bloodshed, death, and destruction, but I also can no longer tolerate the return to a deeply unjust status quo. I can no longer agree to live in this open-air prison. We can no longer tolerate to be treated as subhumans, deprived of our most basic human rights. We are trapped here, trapped between two deaths, death by Israeli bombs and missiles, and death by Israel's blockade of Gaza. The Palestinians in Gaza are demanding something revolutionary for the rest of the world when they hear Palestinians demanding this. It is revolutionary, the fact that it comes from Palestinians, accepted if it were to come from white folks. But coming from people of color, it is viewed as revolutionary. The Palestinians in Gaza are demanded to be treated with full human rights. That is the demand coming from Gaza. That is the demand coming from the West Bank. That is the demand coming from Jerusalem. And that is the demand coming from Palestinian citizens within Israel. That is the demand to have human rights. Not to throw anyone into the sea, just to be treated with human rights. And yet amidst all this, our government is making statements that go beyond reprehensible. Hillary Clinton, who, because she's running for presidency, feels she has to eradicate any vestige of humanity that may be left in her soul. <laughs> and and she's, she said, and really, it's hard to imagine people actually making these statements, but she made this statement. Hillary Clinton has charged Hamas, the legitimate Palestinian government in Gaza, with, and I quote, stage managing the conflict to engender sympathy. In other words, it is the Palestinians who are throwing their children, their women, their men, their schools, their mosques, everything, right into the line of the Israeli fire. They just happen to be in the way of the F-16s. And the whole reason they're doing this is just to gain sympathy. Could there be something more racist? But yet, after 20 years of speaking out on this issue, I am still being asked, why don't we love our children more? 
I am still being asked in regular mainstream reporting that it must be because we don't love our children enough, that we have a culture of martyrdom. That is the way they explain the fact that hundreds of our children are being killed, hundreds of our families are being massacred, almost 2,000 Palestinians killed, and they still hold the victim responsible for the crime. And for many of us in the United States, this should sound familiar. For women, we are the ones that are responsible when we get raped. We are responsible for our own rape. For African American men who get killed by the police, they are responsible for walking home. They had the audacity to walk on the sidewalk. With or without a hoodie, it doesn't make a difference anymore. We are responsible for our own deaths. That's racism, plain and simple. And we should no longer be trying to explain to people we love our children. No, we should not have to be doing this all the time. And yet it seems that with our members of Congress, we have to do this. I no longer talk to our members of Congress because they don't represent us. And it's not as if President Obama has gotten any better than the people that he's chosen to surround himself with because the level of hypocrisy of this very intelligent man, I mean, George Bush Jr. had an excuse. <laughs> Obama said this on August 8th. He said, and I quote, when we have the unique capabilities to help avert a massacre, then I believe the United States of America cannot turn a blind eye. And he's saying this because as justification for the Israeli, the, sorry, the American military, they're very similar, they're funded by the same sources, by the American military to get involved in Iraq. This is the fourth president in a row that is justified in one way or another, another military assault against Iraq. And they all do it for the love of Iraqis, don't you notice? <laughs> they love us literally to death. So no, what has this administration does? This administration has violated, has vetoed an investigation by the Human Rights Commission to investigate war crimes committed by the Israeli government. And is that not enough? They have spent billions of dollars of our taxpayer money to fund the Israeli war machine. And it's not just the military. It's not just the administration that's guilty of this. The media is guilty of this. The New York Times actually doesn't consider our children to be children. The New York Times considers boys that are 15 and 16 and 17 year old to be men. They refuse their classification as children if they're Palestinian. And if they're men, our men have to be guilty because every Palestinian man is a terrorist in their eyes. And I have to say, I have yet to meet a terrorist from an occupied population. And when people sit there and they judge how an occupied population chooses to resist, we should reject flat out the comparison between the violence of the occupier and the violence of the occupied. There is no moral parity between the two. No moral parity between the two. But it's not just the New York Times, CBS, Bob Schieffer, on Face the Nation, blame the Palestinians for the Israeli massacre of their children. And it's not just them. Kofi Annan, sorry, Ben Kimon, I continue to confuse them because UN Secretary Generals have continued to get progressively worse. Ben Kimon has been condemned by more than 129 organizations and individuals, including Jewish Voice for Peace here in the United States, and of course, including Richard Falk. They tell him that he makes no distinction between oppressors and victims. He names Palestinian combatants as perpetrators of violations and war crimes, but he refuses to name Israel of any specific action. He codifies Israeli actions that amount to war crimes, while he insists on prescribing Palestinian reactions to those war crimes as breaches of international humanitarian law. And yet we look to the United Nations as the neutral body. It has lost that a long, long time ago. So we have to ask, what does Israel want amidst all this? We know it's not their security because it's really not under threat. Israel has not been under threat by anyone in Gaza nor by anyone in the West Bank. It's not their security. And what they want, they're openly saying what they want. They want Palestinians to go away. What are they doing? They are taking anything of value in the West Bank. They're leaving Palestinians in cantons, 
imprisoned, separating the West Bank villages from each other, not only separating them from Gaza, in violation of the Oslo Accords, taking over the Golan Heights of Syria, let us not forget, annexing Jerusalem and Judaizing Jerusalem by removing the Christian population in Jerusalem, and continuing to threaten Palestinian citizens of Israel with transfer. The violence is there, codified in their laws. Ahdaf Eswaif, an Egyptian novelist, writes, and I quote, if Israel wants to be a democracy practiced on the basis that some people are chosen and others are not chosen, and if that doesn't work, then it wants those who are not chosen to disappear. And the Israeli government needs to recognize it has to make a choice. It can either choose to be a Jewish state or it can choose to be a democratic state. That is the essence of this conflict. The conflict isn't simply one of who is attacking who and how much siege should be lifted and what kind of a second Palestinian state should we create out of these Bantu stands. The essence of the conflict is, can you create a state chosen and constructed for one religion where you tell people of that religion anywhere in the world you become nationals over the rights of families that have lived in that land for thousands of years. It cannot be a democracy to have institutionalized discrimination of that kind. A democracy has to be based on equality of its citizenship. That is what freedom is. If it's a privilege afforded to some and not afforded to others, it's no longer freedom and it's no longer democratic. And you take it to the second level because it cannot even be a democracy, cannot even be a Jewish state and be peaceful. It cannot be a Jewish state and be peaceful because if we want to create a Jewish state, we constantly have to watch out for this demographic threat. God forbid that the Palestinian citizens of Israel should choose to have more children. And then what do you do with them? Maybe there'll be more as a population. What does that mean, that logic of a demographic threat? If we really understand what that means, that means I have to remove you because your existence threatens me. So I have to make your life very uncomfortable that you choose to leave or I have to kill you. This is the essence of that word, but we don't stop enough to think about it. But they do, and they say it. One of the key advisors to Ariel Sharon, whose name is Arnon Soufer, he was a demographer for the Haifa University, actually said back in 2004, it's the demography. He said, when talking about Gaza, when down the line, when the 1.8 million become 2.5 million and they live in this closed off Gaza, it's going to be a human catastrophe. I'm quoting him. These people will be even bigger animals than they are today. If we want to remain alive, we have to kill and kill and kill all day, every day. His statement was made in 2004. We use the term apartheid, and I've been using the term apartheid because there is a legal definition of the term. And it, there is a crime called the crime of apartheid. It's not so much does it like South Africa or not like South Africa. There are international laws, and Israel fulfills the definition of apartheid. It is guilty of the crime of apartheid. But recently, Noam Chomsky reminded us of something. Noam Chomsky said that Israel is worse than apartheid. He said that the difference is that in South Africa, the apartheid regime in South Africa didn't want the removal of the black South Africans. They wanted them as cheap labor. So they were willing to keep them in Bantu stance, willing to segregate them, to weaken them economically, to weaken them politically, but they were willing to keep them as cheap labor. The Israelis don't even want us as cheap labor. They're getting their cheap labor from Africa where they're also instigating very racist laws against them, such as forced sterilization of, Egypt, of Ethiopian Jews, without their knowledge. It's worse than apartheid, because they want us gone. When we look at all this, and we're faced with this horror, and I have to say, every day it really becomes more horrific. What do we do? What do we do? And I think we have to recognize what it is that we want. And what we want isn't something very revolutionary. We're asking for equality. We're asking for international law. We're asking for human rights. We're asking for an end to impunity. That means if you commit a crime, one way to protect the population from being a victim of that crime again is to enforce some kind of consequences to you. This is the fourth Israeli military attack on Gaza since 2005. 
it has not received any repercussions from any government after these crimes. It mowed the lawn, this is their language. We are not grass to be mowed. So what we are asking for is an arms embargo. The international community, namely from Europe and the United States, finds it very comfortable to ask for a disarmament of Hamas. And I say we disarm the criminals and not the defenders. And we disarm them particularly because we as Americans are the ones that are funding them. We are the ones that are fiscally, not just ethically, responsible for that arms embargo on the state of Israel. We have an arms embargo. We have sanctions placed against the government of Israel. Sanctions. And this may sound quite radical, and I may be asking too much, but we have to ask for what we need, not simply ask for what we can get. Because if we only ask for the crumbs on the table, that's all we're going to be getting. And I don't want those crumbs. Now, the foreign minister of Finland recently said that sanctions against Israel should be an option on the table. That means we have European leaders that are talking about this. So there is a movement that we can propel forward. And that also means that we look at BDS, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement. And here, we have significant connections in our struggle because as we're asking for liberation over there, our liberation over here is intricately tied to the liberation over there. It's literally the same people, literally the same corporations, literally the same funders. That's why you have an Arizona-based migrant justice and humanitarian group called No More Deaths that has endorsed the Palestinian call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions because they are saying, look, when we look at the Mexico-US border, the folks that built the border are the same ones that built the apartheid wall. Same ones, same company, same logic of dehumanization and separation. G4S, the security contractor that Emily spoke about earlier, provides equipment at Israeli checkpoints and it's the largest builder of private prisons. Private prisons. The mere concept is horrific. That's G4S. And it takes it a step further because police departments all over the United States have become increasingly militarized. Who's training them? Israeli police. The US military gives its leftovers to police departments. Why? What does that training do to the police? It ends up having police that look like that. This was Missouri just a few days ago when they shot Mike Brown seven times in the head and the chest with his arms raised. An unarmed man walking home on the sidewalk to see his grandma. With his arms raised, they shot him seven times in the head and the chest. This is a police department? It looks a lot like the Israeli army. It looks a lot like any army. What is happening to this country? And it's not just Mike Brown, who was killed a few days ago. Ezel Ford was killed Monday. Another man whose crime was being a young African-American man. And he was shot in the back while thrown on the floor, shot in the back and killed by the police in Los Angeles. The killing of African-American men in this country has gotten to be so regular, it doesn't even make the news. What makes the news are the riots. The riot makes the news. Again, notice the language here. What makes the news is the rockets from Hamas, not the death of Palestinians from the siege, not the death of Palestinians by Israeli bombardment, not the killing of children in the West Bank by Israeli army that shoots them in front of their parents, but the rockets. And what makes the news in this country are not the killing of African-American men, but the riots. For God's sakes. The link here, the similarity, the dehumanization of people of color, the militarization, it's the same. It's the same struggle. I'm not even reaching out. It's the same. When I read the words of Robin Kelly in his brilliant, brilliant article entitled When the Smoke Clears in Gaza, he writes, and I quote, to fight for a truly democratic, non-racist, humane, sustainable, economically viable, safe and secure world for the people of Palestine and Israel is merely to demand what we have been struggling to achieve in this country for decades. 
as long as the lives of Salim, Khalid Shamali, and Eric Garner, and countless others can be snuffed out by the state or vigilantes for merely being rendered a criminal threat, then none of us are really free. You all know who Salim Khalid Shamali is? He was a young Palestinian man going to see his home and his family in Shuja'iyah during a ceasefire during these past few weeks. He was shot by the Israeli army with a sniper, shot, injured. They shot the ambulance so they would not rescue him, then they shot him again. His father found out by seeing the video that was being circulated of the deliberate killing of his son. You all know who Eric Garner is, an African-American man who was killed by the police in a stronghold, choked to death, another unarmed man, for no crime. I remember the words of Brittany Cooper who recently wrote in Salon magazine, to be black in America, even when you are rich, is to live in constant awareness that you have little protection against violence, either from desperate people in your own neighborhoods or from police who see you as a body to protect themselves from, rather than as a citizen worthy of protection. I read these words and I did not even have to imagine because that's what it feels like to be Arab. That's what it feels like to be Palestinian. Where is our protection from F-16s? Where is our protection when we don't have medicine in our hospitals because our men are viewed as a threat? So even medicine is denied to us. Where is our protection when we cannot travel because our travel is viewed as a threat? It's the same. It sounds very much like being a Palestinian under Israeli weapons. So we connect the struggles. When we talk BDS, we connect the struggles. It's literally the same companies, it's the same language, it's the same narrative. It goes back to the same core, same crime that Martin Luther King was talking about. Militarization and racism. What we have killing our people, be it in Palestine or be it in this country, is racism and militarization and that other word that too few of us dare say, but that is just as hateful, capitalism. You bring those three together and you're bound to have the dehumanization of people to justify certain ends and it has to stop. It has to stop and we have seen movements such as these. This is London. Every week in London there's a larger group of people that are protesting. The protests are growing in London, not getting smaller. We are debating whether that protest was 100,000 people or 150,000 people. That's a debate I like to have. In South Africa, at the beginning of the bombardment of Gaza, at the beginning of that bombardment, people in South Africa were saying the protest in South Africa for the Palestinians were the largest protest for any foreign issue in South Africa. A few weeks later, the protest got to be so large that they said these are the largest protests since political apartheid in South Africa. They see the similarity in the struggle. We need to see the similarity in the struggle. We absolutely need to see it. And we can see it in Durham where we're protesting on Friday, stopping the murders of black and brown. And it's not just black and brown, it's also Latinos, also brown. And it's also if you're poor and white because then your poverty masks your skin color. What do we want is an end to racism. The way we translate that in Palestine is an end to Zionism because Zionism is based on this logic that I can have something that is denied to you solely because of my religion. That is discrimination and we need to say it as such. There is a Jerusalem family that has been denied residency rights. A woman and her child born and raised in Jerusalem having no other residency but a Jerusalem residency. Her residency rights were denied because she's visiting her husband in Canada as he pursues his medical training. So now she is stateless, Palestinian from Jerusalem. But any Jew anywhere in the world can walk in and take her residency. That has to stop. 
We demand a right of return of all the Palestinian refugees. We demand an end to the occupation. We demand an end to the siege. We demand a one state solution, a one secular state. If we in this country believe in separation of church and state, if it's good enough for us, then it's good. Separation of church and state is what we're asking for. And we remember the words of Ella Baker. Until the killing of black men, black mother's sons, becomes as important to the rest of the country as the killing of a white mother's son, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Thank you.